Okay. Maybe I can start with this general introduction and then uh, Angelo can proceed uh, to introduce the speaker. Okay, sure. So we, we, can, we, we are returning to our colloquia in this format, which is the, the one that we can currently grant with this platform and obviously online given the situation. After we were forced to stop our program last year in February due to the COVID-19 outbreak. And uh, for this reason, for this reason, we have decided to devote the three colloquia of this year. Perhaps somebody should turn off the, micros the microphone. Two microphones at the same time are uh, one to many. So, um, so we have decided to start again uh, on in this online format and moreover, we have decided to devote the three, the first three colloquia of this year to the pandemic. So this month we, we have uh, the pleasure of having with us, uh, having with us Ilaria Dorigatti. Next month, Alberto Mantovani will uh, speak about other aspects of the problem on February 17th. And in March, Rino Rapuoli will speak uh, about other, still other aspects of the pandemic in, on March 31st. The other three colloquia have been organized already and they will be devoted to more standard uh, topics for, uh, for us. Uh, one will be devoted to quantum information in April, one will be devoted to astrochemistry in May, and one will be devoted to mathematical physics in June. So thank you for being with us and uh, I would uh, let uh, Angelo introduce uh, our guest. And I would like to thank our guests very much to, for having accepted our invitation. So welcome everyone. <clears throat> so we, uh, as you may have noticed, we, we live in very strange times and the pandemic has completely dominated the news and the, even the people's imagination. And uh, uh, something we have seen is uh, that suddenly many people turned into uh, epidemiologists even people who shall, should have known better, I must say. And Ilaria Dorigatti is definitely not one of them. There is nothing improvised about her career. Uh, she obtained a PhD in applied mathematics from the University of Trento in 2011 with a thesis uh, uh, on the mathematical modeling on infectious diseases. Immediately afterwards, she moved to Imperial College and now she's uh, there as a lecturer and uh, the holder of a, a highly competitive Sir Harry Dale Fellowship. And in her work, uh, she uses mathematical and statistical methods to characterize the transmission dynamics of range of emerging pathogens and uh, uh, to assess the potential impact of novel interventions. Interventions, sorry. She has more than 50 publications in scientific journals, including Science, Nature, and the New England Journal of Medicine. And her work has influenced the current WHO recommendation on dengue vac vac vaccination and global public health decision making. And she's also a member of the Imperial College COVID-19 response team. So she's uh, uniquely qualified to give a talk on the subject of the pandemic. And uh, she will present her work uh, in Vo, which is a small Italian town in which the first official death from COVID-19 was registered. So it's a pleasure to welcome her and uh, uh, thank you very much for accepting and we I'll leave the stage to you. So thank you, uh, Angelo. Thank you, Augusto. And thank you to the whole organizing committee uh, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure. Uh, yeah, to just a moment. There are two, two colleagues uh, whom I should have mentioned. Uh, they are here, Stefano Marmi and Chiara Cappelli. My, the other yes. Points. Thank you. Hi, Chiara, and, and hi, Stefano. Thank you hi. so much for having me uh, with you today. Um, it's a shame that I can't be there in person, but, you know, we are living in strange times, as Angelo said, and we all know why. Uh, this is due to COVID-19, so we will be talking about this uh, in a few minutes. But it's a great pleasure uh, to have the opportunity to talk about the work that I have done over the past year. Um, and I hope that you will enjoy my talk. Um, I'll try and share my screen so that you can see the slides. Um, so 
yes, as we said, um, today's talk, it's about SARS-CoV-2, that's a virus that causes COVID-19. And in particular, we will be talking about uh, what happened in Vaux, which is a small municipality in uh, the Veneto region. Um, so the work that I will be presenting is not just my work. It's a work of many people, uh, many collaborators, both at Imperial College and at the University of Padova, uh, with whom uh, I closely collaborated over the last uh, of the last year. Um, so I would also like to thank the funders, in particular Work and Trust and Royal Society, who have, you know, they are funding my fellowship, uh, as well as the MRC and Jamil Foundation for Center Funding and uh, the funders of the studies that I will be talking to you about today. Um, so today we will see, I will show you some uh, published results as well as some unpublished results. And these are analyses that we are um, really finalizing at the moment and we are hoping to submit uh, to a journal very soon. So it will be great to hear what you think about the new results as well and get your feedback. Um, OK, um, so uh, we've been working a lot over the last uh, year and uh, on the Imperial College website, you will find uh, some resources on COVID-19 if you want to know uh, about you know, the questions that we have asked and uh, the answers that we have tried uh, to find basically to these questions. And so if you just Google COVID-19 reports Imperial, you will end up on this page where you can find, we've got 42 reports to date. Um, the summary of these reports is provided in five languages, included in Italian. Uh, we've got 12 planning tools that you can look at and you know you can explore a little bit yourself, uh, the dynamics and the projections in the future. Um, there are scientific resources. We've tried to make all the data and code publicly available. Uh, there are public resources such as podcasts, webinars and also papers for kids if you want to uh, let your kids learn in kind of simpler terms about COVID-19, as well as all our uh, publications. And uh, before talking about Vo, I thought I would, um, you know, and to put the results of the studies that we obtained in Vo, I think it's important if we contextualize um, you know, where the, the study was conducted and the time at which the study was conducted. And so I will ask you to do this kind of exercise. Let's try and go back in time, one year, nearly exactly one year today, and see where we were and um, how this new coronavirus was uh, discovered and why we started working on it, basically. And so it was 16th of January, uh, 2020, and uh, what we knew was that there were 41 cases reported due to a new coronavirus in Wuhan city. Wuhan is uh, a big, a huge city in Hubei province in China. Um, this new virus didn't have a name. It didn't, it, it wasn't called SARS-CoV-2. Um, it was a new coronavirus. We knew that there were two, there had been two deaths at the time, but all the cases, we were told they were linked to the Huanan seafood market. So these people, who had contracted the virus were either workers or had visited the market. Um, the suspicious thing that made us look into this phenomenon a bit more was that despite there being 41 cases reported there, um, there had been three international uh, exportations. So two cases were reported in Thailand and one in Japan. And this clearly uh, made us suspect that the size of the epidemic in Wuhan was bigger because you can think at the number of cases exported as being kind of proportional to the size of the epidemic. And, and, and this proportion must be given by the number of people who travel out of Wuhan. And so uh, we tried to put these, all these numbers in context and uh, we, we tried to really estimate um, what was the likelihood that uh, the prob the likelihood that the epidemic in Wuhan was as small as had been reported, and so you know we did a very pretty simple calculation to start with, and so we took the number of flights, um, number of people leaving Wuhan daily on average, around th three thousand people leave Wuhan daily, 
And we said, okay, what's the probability that a person leaves Wuhan on a daily basis? Wuhan is a big city, you have 19 million people living there. And, uh, and so you soon realize that in order to explain these three cases reported um, abroad, uh, well, we had to assume a much bigger size of the outbreak in Wuhan. So we found that actually the probability, I mean, the, that one person infected would travel abroad and seek medical care abroad was one in 600. And so really the size of the outbreak there had to have, had, had to be much bigger than what was reported. And so the question was, how likely is it that there are only 41 cases in Wuhan? And the answer was, it's very unlikely. Actually, it's not like, not. I mean, it's outside of our confidence bound. We predicted an epidemic of uh, around 1,700 people, confidence bound between 400 and 4,000. And that was the 17th of January, exactly one year ago. That was a Friday, and um, this um, first report, you will find it in the web page if you want to look at it, um, made the headlines in the news, and people started reacting to it. We received many comments. The voice has disappeared. Reported in, over the weekend, the number of cases reported in Wuhan um, grew from 41 to 440. But along with the number of cases reported in Wuhan, also the number of exported cases grew. And in just a matter of a few days, there were seven cases being detected abroad. So we repeated our calculation using exactly the same method. And what we found was that actually, just a few days later, our estimate of the number of cases was much bigger. So we were around a mean estimate of 4,000 cases with you know, a confidence bound between say 1,000 and 10,000, if we look across all the scenarios. So we soon realized that the, the epidemic was, had been um, you know, underreported. Um, one of the first things um, that an, epidemiology, uh, an, an, an epidemiologist asks um, when a new virus uh, emerges is, okay, is there human to human transmission? And if there is, how transmissible is the virus? And that's an important question because knowing the transmissibility of the virus really tells us about the size of the epidemic. So how many infections do we expect to have at the end of an epidemic if we do nothing? Um, and it tells us about, for instance, vaccination coverage. So how many people should be vaccinated in order to avoid uh, an epidemic if we have a vaccine? Um, so at this point in time, we didn't know whether this virus was human to human transmissible, but clearly with these numbers, we were suspecting that human to human transmission was occurring. Um, so I'm sure you have heard of the basic reproduction number, but just to make sure that we are all on the same line, mathematical definition is the basic reproduction number is the average number of secondary infections that an infected an infection produces at the beginning of an epidemic. So if we assume that we have an R0 of 0.5 and we have four infectious individuals in a fully susceptible population, then on average, these individuals will infect uh, half, um, 0 0.5 subjects, okay? So two people say will not infect anyone and two people will go on to infect one person. At the next generation, one will infect none and the other person will infect one and you see that if you've got an R0, in this case of 0.5, the important thing, the R0 is a, is, a, is a threshold parameter. So if the R0 is below one, your epidemic uh, wanes, fades off. So you don't have an epidemic. If your R0 is bigger than one, in this case, let's assume that it is two. Well, from one case at the next generation, you expect to have two cases. From two cases, you've, each one of these cases will infect two on average. We are thinking about averages, so that is, you know, there can be variability at the individual level, but this is an average measure of transmissibility. And so you see from one, you go to two, from two, you go to four, etc. And so if you plot the number and if you count the number of cases, new cases in the different generations, you see you've got an exponentially growing epidemic. And 
this is not only true for R0 equal to 2. Anytime you've got an R0 above 1, regardless of how slightly above 1 the R0 is, you've got exponential growth in the number of cases. Um, and so, you know, the slow can be, the growth can be very slow at the beginning. That's a property of the exponential. But at some point, you know that the number of cases will explode. That's a property of the exponential. Um, and so, um, um, and, and so it's useful to characterize the reproduction number at the beginning of the epidemic, but then we all know uh, that the reproduction number is also very useful to um, monitor during the epidemic. And this is what we call RT, and it's in the news. It's a, I think everyone knows what the RT is now. Um, and, and we usually, what we usually do is we've got an incidence curve. Incidence curve is we count the number of new cases in time. Say, for instance, the number of new cases with dates of onset on specific dates. And there are well-established methods. They have been developed by a colleague at Imperial College, it's Han Corey, and this method is called EpiEstim, that allow you just knowing the number of new cases and knowing you know, the generation time of this infection, which is well characterized at this point, what the RT is. And so going back to our problem, um, we were trying to estimate the reproduction number for this new virus, and we were on the 25th of January, so just a few days after uh, our first report. We couldn't apply the method that I've just described to you because we didn't have an incidence curve. All we knew were a couple of point estimates of the total number of cases that had been reported in Wuhan, but we had no idea about how these were distributed in time. There were clearly some lags and, you know, the jump that we saw in the cases from 41 to 440 uh, over the weekend was clearly not a representation of the actual infection that was ongoing at the time there, but it was clearly a um, kind of a lag in the reporting. Uh, and so we had to be a little creative in this case. And um, we approached this problem um, using a simulation approach. So we said, um, OK, let's assume that we have 40 introductions uh, from the market. And uh, let's assume that we've got um, a size of the epidemic up to the 16th of January of 4,000. That's what we had estimated with our previous report. So what kind of a note do we have to have in order to explain uh, this epidemic size? And it turned out that we estimated an R0 of 2.6, which is very high. And that meant that this virus was transmitting hum from human to human, and it was highly transmissible. The next thing that an epidemiologist uh, asks himself is, OK, how severe is the virus? What's the case fatality ratio? The case fatality ratio tells us about the probability to die due, due to the infection. And estimating the CFR at the beginning of an outbreak is extremely challenging. It's challenging for multiple reasons. There are some statistical challenges, um, for instance, due to censorship, for instance, due to the fact that what you observe today, um, so you've got some cases today, but you don't know what's going to happen to the cases because you need some time to observe whether they will recover or they will die. So there are issues in terms of, um, you know, censoring, but there are also issues linked to the quality of surveillance and to the type of surveillance that the different places um, report. And so, for instance, we soon, um, you know, if, if you think about um, the spectrum of disease as a pyramid, where at the top you've got the deaths and the more severe cases, and at the bottom you've got the more mild and asymptomatic cases, we soon realized that, you know, there were clearly differences in the CFR reported in different locations. And so, for instance, if you've got a hospital based surveillance where you really pick up the more severe cases that need hospitalization, your CFR will be high. And instead, if you've got a more broad surveillance, maybe able to capture also asymptomatic cases because maybe you do contact tracing, then your CFR estimates will be much lower. And so we soon realized that um, the type of surveillance that had been implemented in Wuhan was uh, really capturing only the more severe cases. And on the contrary, the um, 
type of surveillance captured by international surveillance was much broader. Um, and using very limited data, I must say, this is report number four, uh, published on the 10th of February. Uh, we were able to estimate the onset to recovery and the onset to death delays. Um, these estimates were based on 26 uh, deaths um, identified in China. And I must stress, there was a huge effort put in place uh, to really gather data not just on the cases reported in China, but also internationally. And I must thank all the students who really helped us and volunteered to gather this data, uh, which you know really helped us do some maths basically on it. Um, and so you can see the estimates of the CFR that we got from China were much higher than the estimates of the CFR that we got from outside mainland, Ch mainland China. And maybe it's worth remembering uh, that because there is an onset to death delay, and this is valid also today, you know, what happens today will be shown in the curve of the deaths, in the death incidents three weeks from now, and what we see now in the deaths is what happened three weeks before. Um, anyway, given all, um, um, we also try to estimate the what is called the IFR, the infection fatality rate, so the probability to die due to an infection, which is much more difficult to do uh, because you need to have an estimate of the proportion of population infected. Um, we used estimates of, um, of prevalence observed in the flights uh, of repatriated mm -hmm. uh, subjects, and we got an estimate of around 1%, which considering the limited availability of the data uh, is still valid and so it's quite um, I think a, a good a striking result. The next thing that we looked at was looking at the sensitivity of international surveillance. So, okay so on the 21st of February 29 countries were affected over 1000 of cases had been detected. And just by looking at, just by comparing the expected number of exported cases with the observed number of exported cases, where well, we realized that actually the number of cases captured by international surveillance was the minority of the cases. One out of three cases would have been picked up. And so 70% of the cases really went undetected. And clearly this was a danger. There was clearly potential for undetected chains of transmission to be ongoing somewhere outside mainland China. And that was the 21st of February. And on the 21st of February, uh, the first death due to SARS-CoV-2 was, um, was found in the small municipality of Vaux. Uh, this was the first case reported in Italy and in Europe. Um, that was a case locally acquired. Let's you know, if, if you think about this in, in the context of this death occurring in someone who didn't travel abroad, didn't visit Lombardy, which was what we thought was the most affected country, uh, the most affected region at the time. Um, this person had a relatively quiet life in the village. This was kind of a striking event. And uh, that was clearly demonstrating that uh, what was our fear of this change of transmission occurring in the population undetected was occurring. Um, so this municipality is a small municipality. There are 3,275 residents. And in response to this event, um, a two week lockdown had been imposed, was imposed. So the, you know, the term lockdown is now used for many different things. And uh, as far as I understand, the lockdown that was implemented at the time there was more kind of a travel ban. People couldn't leave the municipality because they were really trying to uh, limit the geographical spread of this virus. But um, within Vau, I think, yeah, cases were isolated, but there wasn't a stay at home order as, uh, you know, the, the, the orders that we have been used to um, we had been used to in, in, in recent time. And uh, what Andrea Crisanti and his team at the University of Padova did at the time was go to Vo and uh, do a swab um, survey, nasopharyngeal swab survey, to try and assess the prevalence. So how many infections were there in Vo at the time? And so they went there, um, they collected the dates of swab sampling and they 
analyzed all these samples using PCR, and together with this, they collected demographic information. They asked people about their health conditions and medication history, their contacts, their symptoms, and the dates of symptoms. And uh, so in the first survey, uh, we managed to capture the 86% of the population. And in the second, okay. And this was the first survey that was conducted uh, between the 21st and the 29th of February. Two weeks after, on the, between the 7th and the 8th of March, a second survey was conducted to reassess what was the uh, prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 after the two weeks of lockdown. And so at the second survey, 71% of the population uh, took part in the study. Unfortunately, we weren't able to capture uh, many of the people in the old categories. So if we looked at, um, you know, if we were com to compare the surveyed versus the non-surveyed population, we would see that we didn't really capture uh, the older age groups. But um, the population uh, in the first and in the second survey were really similar and not statistically different. So we were able to do uh, uh, some good analysis on this. And what we found was at the first survey, so between the 21st and the 29th of March, we found a prevalence of 2.6%. In absolute terms, that means that we found 73, 73 positive cases. So that is 73 cases with active infection. We could find the virus on the nasal swab um, on, the, on the first survey. And on the second survey, the prevalence went down to 1.2%. 1.2% um, prevalence, um, so we had in total 29 positive cases on the second survey, but many, the majority of these cases were cases that were positive at the first. And so in between the first and the second survey, they were, we only detected eight new cases. One of the amazing things that we were able to do in VO was uh, really looking at the proportion of asymptomatic infections. So at the time, we were, um, we thought that there was a, a, a lot of asymptomatic infection and potentially asymptomatic transmission ongoing, but we, there, there, were, there hadn't been a good study performed. Um, you know, there had been some estimates in, in the literature, but I think this was one of the most solid um, estimates that we were able really to provide. And we were able to do that because we um, asked about symptoms symptoms not just at the date of sampling but we also followed up the people so after each survey we then went back to the same persons and asked about uh, the development of symptoms afterward and so what we found is that looking across the two surveys 42 percent of the infections were completely asymptomatic and when i say asymptomatic i mean that they didn't have symptoms at the time of sampling but they didn't develop symptoms afterwards either. If we look at the type of symptoms uh, that these people developed, majority of them had a fever and a cough, but then there was a range of symptoms, including loss of taste or smell, headache, sore throat, and other symptoms. Um, in terms of age and sex patterns, uh, we tested 234 children between zero and 10, and 10 years of age, and we found none positive. That doesn't mean that children do not get infected by SARS-CoV-2, we just didn't detect any. Um, the mean prevalence between people 0 to 50 years of age was between 1.2 and 1.7, but it was threefold higher in the older age classes. We didn't see any difference in the rate of asymptomatic infection between age groups. Um, the majority of the people clear the virus in between the first and the second survey. So 60% of the people tested negative uh, by the end of the second survey, not just with one, but with two uh, tests. Um, and all of the symptomatic people in between 31 and 50 years of age uh, kind of recovered and had a negative test. And interestingly, we found what had been reported and keeps being reported that infection is more frequently associated uh, with being male and of old age. And we still have to understand really uh, why this is. The next question was um, trying to look at 
the viral load. So the viral load is a measure of how much virus you can detect from these swab samples, and that is a measure of how much how of your infectivity, if you want. So how much virus virus you've got within you really determines how much virus you can shed when you breathe, and therefore the transmission potential. And so we tested whether um, the virus, the viral load of asymptomatic, presymptomatic, and symptomatic people were different, and we found no significant differences. Um, what we saw was that among the people who have symptoms, this viral load tended to peak around the date of symptom onset. And that really implies that lots of infectiousness really happens before people show symptoms. And so there is lots of potential for transmission before, before symptoms occur. And from a public health perspective, this is a very um, you know, potentially a very difficult thing to control because if people uh, transmit before they realize they've got an infection, then this is a difficult, uh, I mean, controlling the infection gets more difficult than uh, with other, what would happen with other diseases. Um, sample size were small, but uh, out of the eight new infections, we know that two of them were living with completely asymptomatic infections. And so this, you know, it's not bulletproof, but um, this suggested that infection from completely asymptomatic people could happen. And we found an odd ratio of 44 uh, of being infected if you live with a family member who is infected as compared to if you do not live with someone who is infected. And so clearly living with an infected person is a risk factor. Um, in terms, we did some more some more epidemiological analysis. We looked, we tried to reconstruct the transmission chains, and from the transmission chains, we looked at the serial interval. The serial interval is the time between the infector shows symptoms and the infectee shows symptoms, and so we were able to estimate this around. We got an estimate of 7.2 days overall, which is very much in line with other estimates that were produced at the time. And in terms of reproduction number, we estimated that a, a reproduction number of 2.4. So each person was infected on infecting on average at a 2.5, 2.4 person before the lockdown. And clearly the lockdown worked really well. And this estimate went down uh, to below one uh, after the lockdown. And then we did some uh, transmission dynamics. Um, so um, Usually, when we fit uh, dynamical models uh, to data, we've got time series. And in this case, we didn't have time series. What we had was point estimates of the prevalence. So we knew how many people were infectious uh, at two time points at the times of the two surveys. What we had was the prevalence of infection among different categories among pre-symptomatic, symptomatic and asymptomatic cases. So what we did was we, we used the classical SIR framework. That's a classical model where we divide people into categories and we assume that everyone after they are infected, they follow the same um, infection, uh, the, the, the same infection history. Um, and we fitted the model to this data. So this is a modification of the classical SAIR model because we wanted to capture uh, the pre-symptomatic and the asymptomatic uh, categories. And so basically this, uh, in this model, we assume that people can be divided into compartments according to their infectious state. So everyone starts as a susceptible person. Upon infection, they move into a class that is called E. That's a latent stage, so where people is infected but not yet infectious because there is an incubation period. But after some time, uh, they develop, they become infectious, and so they develop detectable viremia. So if they were tested, they would test positive. They would be infectious, but because we had to capture this pre-symptomatic phase, we assume that this class was asymptomatic at the time. But then some people would move on and develop symptoms and others would be, remain completely asymptomatic. And then after this stage, because we saw a long time of test positivity, uh, we assume that people would still test positive but not be infectious anymore before testing negative. 
And so this is the kind of structure that we developed. And as you can see, we were able to reconstruct the dynamics uh, that we thought occurred in the population at the time. And uh, the, the bar, the vertical line, dotted line, is the time where the lockdown started. Um, from the model, we can get some estimates. Um, yeah, the model has some parameters. We don't know all the parameters, but what we do is we estimate the unknown parameters, and we do that by using some uh, statistical methods. So we want our model to capture as close as possible the data that we observe, and uh, we use some Bayesian methods. They are called Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Um, and we obtained, you know, we, we were able to calibrate the model to the data. And these are the estimates that we got. We estimated a mean infectious period of 3.6 to 6.5 days. We estimated that the infection had likely been seeded at the beginning of February in Vo, and the lockdown had really reduced the transmission by 82 to 99 percent. And the next question was, OK, now we've got a tool that really allowed us to reconstruct the dynamics. And so we could do some counterfactual analysis and we could really explore what would have happened if the lockdown or case isolation wasn't imposed. And so with the lockdown, we estimated that around 4.5 and um, 4.9% of the subject of, of, of the people living involved would be infected by the time of the epidemic. But what would have happened if nothing was done? And if nothing was done, we estimated that this epidemic would have infected 86% of the population. And so in conclusion, um, really this study confirmed that SARS-CoV-2 had spread silently in the population without, you know, without us realizing it for, for several weeks. We found that a large proportion of the infections, 42%, were asymptomatic. Um, we didn't prove that asymptomatic infection uh, could contribute to transmission, but I mean, the we showed that the potential for asymptomatic transmission could be there according to the viral load. And so clearly, you know, there are still discussions about how much asymptomatic infections contribute to transmission as compared as compared to symptomatic infections. And that is because, you know, we know that symptomatic people who cough and sneeze a lot shed many more uh, viral particles than people who breathe normally. But on the other hand, you can think of the fact that if someone is symptomatic and unwell, well, then they may well be limiting the contacts that they have because they are unwell. And on the contrary, people who are totally asymptomatic, they carry on with their life if they are allowed and they can have many social contacts. So there are still discussions about, you know, the role of asymptomatic uh, transmission, but the potential is definitely there. We didn't find infections in children zero to ten years old. Uh, this doesn't mean that children cannot get infected, but potentially we suggested that they could be less susceptible. Uh, but and, and still today there are many unknowns about the pathogenesis of SARS-CoV-2 in children. What though uh, really demonstrated is that this virus and an outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 SARS-CoV-2 can be suppressed and can be successfully suppressed if interventions are implemented in a timely way. And so as long as you intervene with, you know, with measures as much as they are needed early in the epidemic, then you can suppress this virus. And all the data and code um, are available uh, in this in this GitHub repo. And so now I'll move on to the new part. This I haven't presented this, so this is the first time uh, you'll see these results. It's still work in progress, uh, but we are hoping to submit this very soon. And so after these two surveys, they were nasopharyngeal surveys, we did two other surveys. And so the first was done in May, between the 1st and the 3rd of May, and then the second was done recently uh, tw from the 28th to the 29th of November. And we didn't just look at active infection, so we didn't just do the PCR, we looked at antibodies because we want to learn about uh, the immune response among these people who, you know, in this population, basically. And so um, in May, we were able to test uh, 2,600 people um, and uh, around 88% of these people 
had the PCR results from the February and March. So we were very lucky to have this information. It's a well characterized population. Um, we did a rather unique thing, I must say. So usually, um, you know, many labs do serology using one assay. And here we used three different commercial assays that are used uh, to assess seroprevalence. So on the majority of, of the people, we run three different assays to compare uh, what the results of, you know, serological, of the serological assays would be. And on top, we did the neutralization assay. And so um, the three assays are the Abbott, uh, it tests for the N antigen, the Diasorin, uh, it tests for the spike, and the Roche that gives a total measure of ant IgG antibodies. OK, so because we had because we tested the people with different assays, then we had a problem of having assay discordance at individual level. So for instance, if you look in the table in the second row, you can see that in May we had, for instance, 11 people who tested positive by Abbott and Roche, but negative to the Diasorin. And uh, this kind of raises some questions about uh, what is really the status of the subject? Was this some, you know, people with discordant estimates, are they infected or are they false positive? Are they false negative? What is the real status? Were they truly infected or not? And this discordance in the estimates at the individual level get translated in discordant estimates of the seroprevalence at the population level. So in this plot, for instance, in blue here, is shown uh, the proportion of samples testing positive. That's kind of the raw several prevalence estimate. It's just number of, of subjects testing positive among those tested. But if you adjust these estimates, the pink, if you look at the pink um, estimates, um, in dashed lines, well, then you see that you've got kind of discordant and significantly different estimates of the civil prevalence at the population level. And so this raises the question of what is then the true civil prevalence? And so in order to ask, answer this question, uh, we implemented a likelihood based estimate. So basically we wanted to estimate uh, the probability of observing all the different combinations of assay. And we did that by estimating the true uh, sensitivity and specificity on the assay. And by doing this, we get an estimate of around 3.5%. So that's our best zero prevalence estimate in the population. Beyond estimating the sensitivity and the specificity of the assays, we can look at the probability of being a true infection given that you have a positive case. And so you see that different assays have diff different um, pr probabilities. And so, for instance, for the Diasorin, if you look um, at the uh, second to last row, you see that the probability of being a true infection, given that you have a positive Diasorin test, is 0.6%, is 60%. Very you get very different estimates if you get a Nabot test or a Roche test. On the other hand, if you have a negative result, you are not you have not been infected and this is a negative um, predicted value the npv uh, and then we did some association analysis so we looked at um, the association between the antibody response in terms of antibody titers magnitude of the antibody titers detected with these different assays with age bmi uh, with AG and BMI, and we found a significant association in terms of antibody response, antibody levels uh, by age and by BMI. There is a pattern in BMI, so people with higher BMIs tend to have higher antibody levels, according to the results that we observed in May. We didn't see any difference in terms of antibody titers between symptomatic and asymptomatic infections hospitalized or non-hospitalized, so severe or non-severe cases, and males versus females. Um, and this is different from some reports that have been uh, reported in the literature. And, um, you know, the reports that we have seen really relate to the acute or the early phases of the convalescent phase. And here we've got estimates at longer term because May 
is May and, and November is three to ten months after the epidemic start. So here we've got kind of uh, long term estimates of, of association. And I think it's a good news, the fact that we don't see differences between, for instance, symptomatic and asymptomatic uh, infections. Um, we looked at the antibody decay. So in November, we tested again the people who tested positive in May. And so what we saw is that there was a significant difference in the antibody titers observed between May and November with the Abbott test, but not with the other two tests. And so of the people who tested positive in May, 36% tested positive in November with the Abbott. And so you can see a quite mm, significant decline in people testing positive with that assay. But with the other two assays, I mean, with the diasaurin, 78% of the people testing positive in May were still testing positive in November. And vast majority, 98% of the people testing positive in May were still positive in November with the Roche assay. Um, we were able to estimate um, the half-life of, of the antibodies uh, detected by the different uh, assays. Um, and if you note in the second graph, uh, sorry, in the second row, you will see these are paired um, measurements. So a line will join the measurement in the same people. You will see that there are some lines going upwards. And in particular, we found a small number of people who have doubled their antibody titers. And these are people who tested positive in May. So I think this is really saying that there is some evidence of re-exposure. Um, so these people have likely been re-exposed to SARS-CoV-2, but as far as we know, they none of them um, experienced any symptom. Then we looked we did a bit of modeling again, and we looked at the within house transmission. So we were able uh, to characterize the infectious status of the members of 1,118 households. So that means that for each household member uh, in these households, we knew whether they were had been infected or not. And so this table really tells us in, for how many for the different house, for households of different sizes, how many infections we observed? Zero, one, two, three, and four. And so we did some modeling. We applied uh, the model developed by Fraser et al. Uh, this is a, general, a generalization of the classical read frost model. This is a model that basically tries, well, it does uh, estimate the final size, the probability of observing zero, one, two, three, and four cases um, within the households. And, and we did this by testing different assumptions. Uh, we tested basically different models. One model was assuming over dispersion in the number of secondary cases. That means assuming that um, not everyone was infected this was infecting the same number of people. So we saw at the beginning that the reproduction number is an average estimate of the number of secondary cases. And we assume that and we assume that this distribution, this number has a distribution and we assume that it was largely over dispersed. So there can be people infecting zero P other people and people infecting a, a large number of people. This is what we did in model V, assuming over dispersion in the number of secondary cases. We assume that there were that there was a, a, a dependency in, in the potential for transmission according to the household size. So if you were living in a household with many different people, with many different household members, uh, then you had a, probab a different probability of acquiring the infection as compared to a household uh, of two, or maybe if you were living alone. Um, we tested whether um, a proportion of, it was likely that a proportion of subjects had zero reverted. That means from testing negative to testing positive and whether there, were, there was um, support for a proportion of subjects to isolate. Um, we characterized the goodness of the model according uh, to a criterion. It's called the DIC. It takes into account the goodness of fit and the number of parameters. So it, can, it tries to penalize the models that have the more parameters. Um, what we find 
basically, if you look, then the, the, the smaller the DIC in the second panel, the better the model. All of the models that have a better DIC are all models that assume over dispersion in the offspring distribution. So that assumes that the number of secondary infection generated by a person is slightly different within the population. And how different is it? It's hugely different. We estimated that 80% of the infections is due to the 20% of the subjects in the population. That is a highly overdispersed um, offspring distribution. And um, we were able to characterize what was the probability of transmission within the household, and we found that is around 30%. Then we looked at the impact of contact tracing. So in VO, when they detected the first death, a huge effort was put in place to identify patient zero. That was still the aim at the beginning of the outbreak. And so independent, you know, the routine contact tracing team went into VO and uh, collected this data about, uh, you know, uh, contacts. So they asked all the different people who tested positive, who they had contacted, and then they went on and they contacted the contacts of these people and they isolated them. And we had a unique opportunity here because we did two, um, two um, PCR surveys. We could really compare uh, among these people who were contacted by contact tracing who was positive uh, according to PCR. And we found that 44% of the trace contacts were positive. And so this gives us the opportunity to look again at a counterfactual scenario and say, OK, what would have happened if instead of mass testing, we would have continued to do contact tracing? And this is what would have happened according to uh, our model. So assuming just contact tracing and not mass testing, so not isolating all the positive cases, but just isolating the people who were named as contacts, um, here we tested different assumptions on uh, the potential of these traced people to uh, infect other people. We also assumed complete isolation so that the people that were uh, really traced didn't contribute to transmission. But you can see that contact tracing alone without testing has a very limited uh, impact, not just on the dynamics, but on the final size as well. And so in conclusion, uh, what we found is that really seroprevalence estimates at the population level vary significantly by the assay used. Uh, they vary because of the different assays have different sensitivities and specificities, and these in turn really depend on the labs as well. But this implies that estimates obtained around the world with these different assays in different locations may, may be hard to compare. And we saw that in VO where we, um, where we could compare with the three different assays. Um, antibody decays varies by assay. Uh, so, and in particular, uh, the seroprevalence surveys using the Abbott assay may really underestimate the actual proportion of infected subjects. And the Abbott assay was used in Spain and also in Italy uh, for to do the national seroprevalence studies. So potentially the estimates uh, obtained in that survey are really underestimates of the true number of, of people infected. Um, as I said, antibody titers and persist in this in this study, we provide estimates of the antibody titers and persistence over the long term. Uh, we saw no difference by severity, but we saw consistently different differences by age. Um, we saw how most of the transmission is due to the minority of infection. Um, and I must say, if you know, if we try and build on the evidence that we had around um, the infectiousness of asymptomatic and symptomatic subjects, you know, we couldn't find a real cluster who had um, a much higher um, infectiousness. And so, it, you know, we cannot say this for sure because we did, we we haven't characterized the dynamics of the viral load within. The different subjects, but it is possible that just behavioral uh, factors are really um, the drivers of this um, kind of over dispersion and uh, big difference in, in the amount of transmission uh, that 
a person a person uh, can cause. And uh, clearly there is an enhanced surveillance is, is still a priority and it is still a priority also during and after the vaccine is being rolled out. Uh, so we find that, you know, it is important not just to enhance testing, but also contact tracing. Um, and so what have we learned? Uh, from the experience of VO. So VO has been a successful experience in terms of uh, suppress, suppression of the virus. And in VO, timely implementation of measures have really managed to, um, to really end uh, at least the first wave. And uh, drawing from this, uh, well, we know now that delays in the implementation of, of, of the interventions have huge impact on lives. And this is and these are estimates uh, that have been produced by the uh, real time modeling team at Imperial, uh, where they looked at the impact of interventions. So imposing the lockdown here in England one week earlier or one week after, uh, as compared to the actual dates. Uh, on the number of deaths. And you see that, you know, just imposing the lockdown one week earlier would have reduced the deaths from 36 and 700 uh, thousand to 15,700. So that's a massive reduction in the number of deaths. And there has been discussion about around, uh, you know, the potential impact of these measures and there is real worry and it's totally understandable about the worry that these measures and these lockdowns have had on the economy uh, but looking you know at the trade-off if you want between economical impact and deaths it looks like countries that really manage to keep the death toll down also manage to have uh, the less impact on the economy and these are mostly uh, Asian countries and, uh, for instance, New Zealand, who did really well and imposed very early interventions um, early on during the epidemic. Um, we also saw that in VO, you know, the large scale testing was able to pick up that transmission was ongoing and that was done much before the standard and routine surveillance was able to really detect the level of transmission. And uh, this is also something that we have seen in England, for instance, where, you know, for instance, in England, there is a react study where um, swabs are sent by post to people. They are randomly selected within the population. And um, just by looking at, you know, the presence of the virus in these uh, self taken swabs, it is possible to detect early changes in transmission. And so, for instance, in this report uh, that's done by Stephen Riley, um, already at the beginning of September, they, they, there was no doubt about the fact that the second wave had started. And that, and, and that kind of evidence came much before uh, surveillance, routine surveillance, syndromic surveillance picked it up. There are many open questions. This is not a full list, but just to mention a few. What's the role of children in transmission? Uh, there is mixed evidence on, on the relative susceptibility and, and, and the contribution of children to transmission. Uh, some studies find that uh, children are uh, more susceptible, others that are less. Um, so I think that this is very much an open question. And also in terms of symptoms, symptoms like some studies have reported that children being more asymptomatic, um, in VO, uh, from the second survey, it looks like children are actually maybe more symptomatic than asymptomatic. So there is mixed evidence. Um, how long does immunity last? Um, you know, we really don't know how much the naturally acquired immunity lasts. We haven't had the chance to observe it yet. And but then the next question is how much will vaccine derived immunity last and what are the differences between the two? Uh, does the vaccine protect against infection and transmission? All we know, we've got estimates of the efficacy against uh, of the efficacy of, the va of this vaccine. But in my understanding, the efficacy estimates that are given really represent estimates against the disease. But that doesn't imply that a vaccine can block 
infection or can block transmission. And that doesn't just have uh, an important impact on the modeling work that we do, it has impacts on, on the life of everyone. Um, can vaccine derived herd immunity ever be reached? There are, you know, debates and questions around this. And this is um, something that came up today. Can the new variants escape immunity? So can you can people infected with the old variant get reinfected with the new variant? There has been a new uh, report published today that suggests that, uh, you know, the new South um, South African variant actually can reinfect people, which is not great news. Um, there are challenges ahead and one of the big challenge is the new variant. So we've seen a number of new variants coming up in a relatively short time span over the last few weeks or maybe months. We've got a UK variant, a South, a, a South African variant, a Brazilian variant, and they all share some similarities, which is worrying. Um, they are, they show increased transmissibility and, you know, from a public health perspective, that means that what we used to do against the old variants does not necessarily work with the new variant and we may need tougher uh, measures to really um, bring these new variants under control. And um, one of the things that is of concern as well is around the global spread of these variants already. So, you know, some countries and many countries have travel bans in place uh, to stop these variants entering, but there are some suggestions uh, around the fact that potentially these variants are already in the countries and unless genomic surveillance is conducted and is enhanced, then it won't be possible to pick it up until uh, some time ahead. So there will be communication challenges, I think. Um, vaccination is a great thing and we are, you know, it has been a huge effort and scientific achievement, but I think it will be important to send the message around vaccination is not a substitute for non-pharmaceutical interventions and the adherence to recommendation will have to be uh, you know, met during and after the vaccine rollouts and potentially more interventions are needed. And uh, you know, there are several challenges uh, around vaccination. Um, you know, taking a high view, there are there is a challenge, there is a challenge of equity and global access. It looks like, and it is like, I mean, you know, rich countries and high income countries will have access sooner and more access to vaccine than low and middle income countries. Um, yeah, which is, you know, we can discuss about the fairness and the equity of this. There are challenges in terms of production. Uh, there will be limited doses and uh, decisions will have to be made around who we vaccinate first. Um, there are issues around acceptance and population willingness to get this vaccine, which is safe and effective. Um, and as I mean, in, here in England, for instance, there are different strategies of vaccination. Here in England, for instance, uh, they have taken the approach of delaying the second dose in order to give the vaccine, the first dose to more people. We don't know what the efficacy of this um, of this strategy will be, but early, you know, I mean, from the clinical studies, it looked like this, the first uh, vaccine was, the first dose was quite effective. So this is why this kind of strategy has been implemented on the large scale. And it is quite possible that going on uh, a mix and match approach, so people may receive different uh, vaccines if the same is not available. But despite all these challenges, um, I think that there is light at the end of the tunnel and I'm hopeful that there is light at the end of the tunnel uh, and this is vaccination. So, um, and yeah, and uh, for the most cynical of you, uh, there is not a rail track on this tunnel. It's proper light. It's not something else. And uh, this is all I had prepared for you today. And uh, again, I'd like to thank you for the attention and for the opportunity to present this work. And a special thank to the population of all who really helped us uh, to do these studies and to learn a lot, a lot about COVID-19, not just for the benefit of science, but for the benefit of everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting and very instructive presentation.
Now we will have some people who will ask uh, questions and I would suggest uh, that under the circumstances they write the question in the, or at least they, they ask uh, to be allowed to ask the question in the chat and then I will somehow direct the, the audience, uh, order the intervention so that we don't get uh, too much confusion. Maybe I can also uh, somehow take have the privilege of asking one, uh, one question, but you, you basically said it. Uh, I wanted to reinstate uh, the point that uh, you referred uh, to at some point. Uh, now, the governments uh, have uh, hesitated. They were not competent enough on these matters. They, they have, if they are competent, which is not obvious, they are competent in other matters in general. So they hesitated with lockdowns. So and uh, so the question is, uh, but it was said in your uh, in your intervention already. Uh, just to repeat it because it's very shocking. Suppose that uh, let's concentrate on the second phase here, for instance, in, in Italy. And the second phase uh, uh, essentially more than doubled the number of deaths, because if I remember correctly, we were around uh, 30, 35,000 uh, last summer, and now we are about 80. At 80,000. So it's a, it's a factor of two. Germany is even worse. Germany is a factor of four, if not more. The question is, had they uh, somehow anticipated the intervention when they should have been done, when people, when scientists were uh, somehow telling them to do it, uh, this lockdown by, say, two, three weeks, how many lives would we have saved, say, in Italy in the second phase? And then I will leave the room to the other people. Yeah, well, I, I, I can't provide estimates, you know, I haven't looked at this specifically, so I, I won't um, comment on on what would have happened because I didn't do this modeling. But um, I think, you know, all we all knew that a second phase, a second wave was quite likely and it was expected there to be a second phase, uh, a second wave. Um, and that is really driven by the fact that until there is herd immunity in the population, they, you know, as soon as the contacts in the population uh, start uh, raise, you know, increasing again, then, uh, you know, this uh, virus can start spreading again. So it wasn't a surprise to see a second wave. Um, there is a component, if you want, of cl clearly, you know, there are political uh, these are political decisions. It's not just public health. Um, it's they are economical and um, they are economic decisions and and decision making. I think is a complex process, but uh, at least here in England, um, the government knew that um, earlier measures were more beneficial, but still they hesitated. Um, I must say there is. Also, which I didn't discuss, an environment, a climatic, a seasonal, a seasonal component. This is something that I have looked at with my colleagues, uh, Will Pierce at, at Life Sciences, and we see there is a clear seasonal pattern. It's not to ask you, yes. Yeah. So um, we can't really disentangle about whether the virus itself is less transmissible in the summer or whether it is the people who spend more time you know, outdoors and there are less chances of getting infected because outdoor there is less, less risk. But there is a clear component. We did this analysis at the US level. Uh, the paper is on MedArchive, but it is under revision in a journal. And there is, uh, you know, there is a striking um, association in transmission with, first of all, population density, but also climate. And uh, the, relation, the, the relationship is with temperature. So colder places tend to have higher transmission potential. And this means that, it, you know, the winter may have kind of boosted the level of transmission um, that uh, was occurring. The good news is we are going towards spring and the summer. So if that helps, maybe that will help us control this virus. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's not, as you say, it's not all down to seasonality. That's one of the components, but I think the second wave was rightly predicted to occur across Europe. And um, yeah, there has been a bit of hesitancy. 
for many reasons which you know just go beyond uh, my competence I must say. So there are a couple of questions. Uh, I would invite uh, Simone Zanotto to ask his question. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for your very interesting talk. I have a question about the, the modeling of spreading within family and, and in general within enclosed spaces. Could you please comment about the role of closed spaces and possibly is there any quantitative model for for dealing with it? Um, so I'm not familiar with specific models for enclosed spaces. What I know has been done is review of the type of attack rates. Uh, so the, the, the proportion of infections that have been observed in different settings. Uh, and I know there are databases of uh, super spreading events, for instance. So, if, you know, places where um, a huge, a large number of people have been infected. And there is a striking correlation between enclosed spaces and super spreading events. So we now know that, for instance, um, you know, gym. Yes, so places where there is lots of um, breathing out. So for instance, gyms or choirs or churches where there has been lots of singing have been associated with these super spreading events. Um, there are other settings that have seen lots of transmission. For instance, meat production or in general food production factories. Um, it's still unclear why that happened, but it is thought that you know the very low temperatures may be um, factors that are kind of enhancing transmission in those uh, places. Um, this is what we did here was modeling uh, transmission within households. And as far as I know, this is the first model of within household transmission uh, for SARS-CoV-2. And uh, it's it's just because this data are very rare to acquire. And so it's the model is not new, as you've seen. Uh, we just use um, a model that has been proposed and applied for flu. Uh, it, it has been applied for flu in, 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 in 1918. But um, having this data on you know, have, knowing the status of the population of of family members of all the family members um, within a significant number of households is is a rare thing to have. Thank you very much. There's another question by Akash Biswas, please. Yeah, appears to be. I mean, transmission within enclosed spaces appears to be. Um, higher than transmission uh, in uh, in the open open spaces. Akash, are you there? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for such an interesting uh, talk. Um, I, I was very curious. Uh, I was in fact looking uh, into your slides if there is some word like drug repurposing and uh, do you think we should look into closely look into the drug repurposing data to search for a cure because um, to vaccinate everyone it's uh, it will take some time and uh, and drug repurposing may help to uh, find a cure for that yeah i'm not i'm not an expert on this uh, but you know there have been huge advantages ad, ad, advances in uh, uh, treatment of cases in hospitals so we've learned uh, a lot throughout this year and you know the conditions and the treatment that have been applied that are applied nowadays as compared to what was known at the beginning of the outbreak um is strikingly different now we can cure and we can uh, uh really uh, support the people in the hospitals much more efficiently than than before. Um, I'm not sure about uh, this repurposing at the population level. Um, I mean, for milder diseases, I'm not really an expert of, on this, so I, I can't really comment. But I agree that it's quite clear that vaccinating the population will take some time. Um, realistically, what we are you know, in terms of modeling, what we are thinking and what we are modeling is rather than repurposing drugs, which I don't know of many, I must say, it's more 
coupling vaccination strategies and clever vaccination strategies. So, you know, vaccination strategies can be done in many different ways. And um, we can explore um, clever ring vaccination strategies, just to say, um, and um, a, a bit more efficient vaccination strategies um, to be delivered in the population in the event that you know there is there are constraints on the vaccine doses, but they these will have to go along with more non pharmaceutical interventions. And as I said, it's not that vaccination solves all our our issues, and uh, we will be able to go back to our old normal. I think so. We will have to be patient again. Yeah, I was about to stress the, that point. Because I have the impression that vaccination at best will be like vaccination against flu. So it will have to be repeated uh, in short intervals, yearly say. And uh, with this kind of numbers, uh, it is difficult to, to do it once. Imagine to do it every year. So I'm not so optimistic about it. The, the end of the tunnel will be there. It has always been like that in, in the history of, uh, of the world. But uh, the question is how long it takes is not so... And yeah, there is. There is endemic, like you know. And, uh, exactly. So there is this question about whether this virus will become endemic, and the fact that we've seen new variants coming up is not terribly good news. Um, but yes, um, vaccination is a tool, and as long as people are happy to accept it, it it can help us. This is what I think. Sure. There is another question by Alberto Luciani. Please, Alberto. This is a curiosity of mine. I would like to understand whether this Markov Monte Carlo fits can help understanding whether there is a fraction of a population that is immune, independent of having had the infection, perhaps, for instance, for exposure to other viruses of the same family. So I, my question is, do you have a parameter that uh, uh, models a possible presence of a fraction of the population that is not uh, susceptible to the uh, infection uh, and uh, whether you have some sensitivity to it? As far as I understand, uh, some uh, sp uh, specific cases like uh, the spread of, uh, of the infection in uh, U.S., uh, um, <clears throat> A correctional facility points that 100% uh, of the population is probably um, uh, susceptible. But I, I'd like to understand whether these fits uh, that are uh, quite complex and use the data in the most uh, um, complete way have uh, any sensitivity to that. Um, so, yes. Um, okay, so in the within household transmission model, I have looked at um, the proportion of, of of people isolating or practicing social distancing, um, which may somehow address, you know, your question. And uh, we find that, yeah, there was some evidence of, of, of a fraction. I don't have the estimates at the top of my mind now, but I agree. And, um, you know, I agree that there doesn't appear to be any protection from the past viruses. This is a new virus completely new and different from the other viruses. Um, and um, I totally agree up around, you know, the assumption that 100% of the population is um, totally susceptible. Um, I think I, we, we also explore that. I think it's not in the paper, but we explored that at the beginning, and I think there wasn't support for that as well. So. You know, I, I would totally agree on the fact that the population is totally susceptible unless it acquires the, the virus either naturally or with vaccination and it develops an immunity. Other Thanks. questions, which could be the last if people don't want to ask uh, more. My question is the following, a naive physicist uh, attitude uh, to try to understand why the, the pathology that follows, uh, that is induced by, by the virus, uh, uh, is more uh, 
effective or more damaging for older people, a naive uh, attitude would be just saying that if you have a, a lighter rope and you pull it, then you break it more easily. So in other words, I mean, the, the virus is a stress uh, factor for the organism and an organism which is less elastic, so to speak, uh, could respond uh, less efficiently. Is, is that uh, along the lines of our understanding or we have something better to qualify why younger people uh, tend to be asymptomatic and uh, older ones tend to suffer more and more. Um, yeah, I think we didn't see differences, tracking difference in the fraction of, you know, asymptomatic. So the proportion of people asymptomatic wasn't different by age. So we saw the same level of symptoms occurring across all the ages. At some point, people were talking about the, the blood, you know, the, the type of... Uh, uh, how to say blood uh, category was A, B or, or B, there, there was something that was more affected than uh, than other. Oh, OK. I haven't looked at that, so I can't comment on this. Um, I really don't know if that is a factor. Um, what I can comment on is the fact that, you know, the older you are, the more likely you are to have other underlying conditions. Yeah, which are vascular diseases, yes. you know, and, and so the naive attitude is not so naive and it works more or less. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it, it's quite clear that with old age, lots of issues yeah. come along. Yes, and uh, yeah, and so that may clearly affect um, the, the response that um, you know, one is able to mount, an old person is able to mount compared to uh, younger people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah this is uh, what I would say. Um, they, you know, there are also just in terms of, uh, you know, it's, 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 um, it's a matter of social contacts as well. I mean, I think uh, we have seen different patterns across the waves. So if initially it was kind of older, at least here in England, if during the first wave it was mainly older people getting infected, then during the second wave we saw very much younger people getting infected. But it's not that the virus has changed, it's just that the contacts, just that the, you know, it was more young people not adhering to recommendations and, um, and getting infecting, infected more. Um, Actually, apparently in Germany it went the other way around. In Germany, the second wave affected more the older people, and that's why they had so many more deaths, especially in the eastern part of Germany. So it's, uh, okay. Yeah, so it's, I mean, there are all sorts of behavioral factors going on, I think. Uh, and yeah, and these are due to communication, you know, challenges and uh, yeah. Very good. I, I think on behalf of all our community, I thank you very much for this uh, beautiful presentation and very well centered on the spirit of this uh, multidisciplinary audience. Thank you very much for being with us virtually today. <laughs> Maybe if we ever get past uh, this kind of uh, unusual situation, which will not become usual, then you are most welcome to come and see us. Uh, you, you know Angelo already, so that uh, Thank you very much again. Thank I'm, you. Yeah, thanks. Here, maybe then, uh, uh, Angelo. Yes. Hi. Yes. Thank you very Hi. much. We really Hi. appreciated this. Thank you to you all. I hope you enjoy the presentation, and uh, I we will do. be happy to come along and and see you in person at some point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.